Good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting in 2018 of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silence. Uh, apologies have been received from Jackson Carlo, MSP and Mary Gujan, MSP, this morning. Our first item of business today is the fifth evidence session in our inquiry into Scotland's screen sector, which today will focus on finance, investment and support. And we will hear from two panels today. I'd like to welcome our first panel of witnesses, Sajid uh, Quayam, uh, Head of Production at Caledonian TV, Annie Griffin, Creative Director with Pirate Production, Nesim Ali Keru, Producer with Blazing Griffin, Lauren Boswell, the Scotland organiser with Equity, and Grant McPhee of Tartan Features. Uh, welcome and thank you for coming to speak to us today. Uh, this section is focusing on funding and support, and our inquiry generally is focused on the Screen Sector Leadership Group's recommendations uh, and whether they are um, being enacted and what needs to be done to make sure that they happen. One of the Screen Sector Leadership Group's uh, criticism of public funding uh, for Screen was that it was very, very fragmented. And I wonder whether you could um, reflect on that in terms of your own experience and where you would like to see it, it uh, change. I don't know who would like to go first. I can, I can jump in. Uh, do you mean fragmented in terms of where we get support from? Yes. In terms of the, okay, yeah. yeah. Um, so at Blazing Griffin, we are, we're a film production company. We also do um, video games and we have film post-production as a service as well. And um, we get support from Scottish Enterprise, uh, from uh, Creative Scotland for production and development, and uh, also from SDI for when we look to increase our ability to sell internationally, uh, attend markets and things like that. So it is, um, and also, sorry, uh, Scottish Enterprise, both for business growth and also for training development and things like that. So where we get support from is fragmented. Um, we have learned over the last three years, I suppose, how for us best to access each of those different places. We have an advantage over others in our industry, I think, because we have a broad uh, range of, we, we operate in a broad range of uh, sectors. Uh, and we slightly did that by design because in order to become investable as a company, it just so happened that it also makes you supportable by uh, the public sector. So uh, I guess what I'd say is, <clears throat> Whilst the fragmentation has has not hindered us at all, if it, I can see how f our uh, fellow producers, it is a hindrance um, because it takes a lot of capacity just to have all of those relationships to figure out all the different ways that you should be presenting yourself, the way that you present yourself uh, for uh, equity investment. Uh, in your company as a whole is completely different from the way that you present your package of intellectual property for development support. Uh, and uh, if you are a two to five person company, that can be, that's, that's a huge burden. Uh, and to be clear, we probably, uh, almost certainly wouldn't have had any Scottish enterprise support if we were only a film company. Uh, so it, yeah, I can, and we don't specifically get support for film-related activities from Scottish Enterprise, uh, so which has not been a problem for us, but it's because we worked around it uh, rather than because it's directly supposed to be that way, I guess. Yeah, no, and Nason is is the exception, I think, and congratulations yeah. for um, getting support out of Scottish Enterprise. <laughs> and I think it's it's brilliant that there is a company that has you know harnessed film and TV making with them. Um, the games industry. I think the rest of us, it's difficult, and it's, I'm sure you've heard this before, and congratulations on educating yourselves so much about our industry and, and for the whole thing. It's so great to know that, um, that you are interested in our industry and want to support our industry and see the potential for our industry because we have, you know, I've lived in Scotland for 20 years and it has been, it has been very tough. So as a company, when my company prior to 20 years ago was based in uh, London, the, you know, it is always hard, the, the pitch and development and 
uh, whether you go to pilot and whether you go to series, that is a long process getting television um, projects commissioned. And every company needs a kind of thing that they do to keep going. And at the time, we did interstitials for MTV Europe. And if there was ever a period of nothing getting nothing getting development money, we, we got a title sequence or short films from uh, MTV Europe or other networks like that. Since I've moved to Scotland, there hasn't been that possibility. And my company has tried to... Um, make things for children's television, different things, um, w and we haven't, yeah, we don't have any experience of video games or a, or a, a business model that would look more acceptable to um, the fun the uh, what Scottish Enterprise wants to see. We have received uh, slate funding from Creative Scotland, which has been very appreciated. I think the overall problem historically in Scotland is that you you have Scottish Screen and then Creative Scotland. Uh, investing development funding, but if there is nowhere to go, you know, you, it's the worst position to be in is that you develop something and then it gets not back by the network. But my, my company specializes in TV. We have done feature film, but for television to constantly be knocked back. And that's uh, why I think, and we'll get to talking about it, the new network has is the most important thing that's that's come out of this process and and potentially the, mo the, the, the best... Um, possibility for us. Um, but at the moment, at the moment, I'm uh, working on a show in London, which is for a new network um, and for RTE and uh, seeing the, um, well, just, uh, I was saying to Nathan before we came in, within two weeks of pre-production in London, I've probably run into 10 decision-making executives that I haven't seen in a year because I'm in London, because I'm in the middle of it. And, and that's uh, not having decision-makers in Scotland, in terms of getting things greenlit, is the worst problem for us. And that we can, that unless it, we get joined up between Creative Scotland and the potential of a new network, I think um, uh, it will continue to be a problem. So, so she I think, from our perspective, uh, from Caledonia TV, predominantly we are um, a factual, non scripted uh, documentary and drama doc uh, company. Um, it, again, it's entirely different, although I tend to agree with Annie in general that. Um, funding is uh, very rare in, in our cases uh, and in the kind of programs that we work across and anything that we want to fund for de or anything we want to uh, push towards development comes from uh, existing production budgets um, and uh, whilst we accept that television is perhaps seen to be more uh, <coughs> uh, 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 you know garners its own money um, uh, there are instances in the past where certain production funds from Scottish Enterprise uh, have worked for us. We've been around for 25 years now, um, and a, 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 I would go back. We'd have to go back to about 17 or 18 years ago before we actually um, uh, received any funding. And there's a particular pot of funding which we can come back to uh, that we did receive from from um, a Scottish Enterprise at the time, uh, which really helped us to, in our development and uh, helped grow the, grow the company um, exponentially. Um, so. There has been uh, funds in the past that have worked uh, in our industry, especially particularly in television, but now we're finding that those pots are no longer there, that the, the products that are on um, offer from Scottish Enterprise and others um, aren't really um, relevant to us in our industry. Um, and the worry with going forward here, and we'll obviously come on to more about the um, the SSLG and, and, and what it's doing, <coughs> is that again, the focus tends to be primarily on, on drama, um, and scripted, which is which is important, and you know it's it's it's, it's important for a growing industry. But um, for example, Creative Scotland right now only has really lottery funding, and then therefore there's no way of us approaching any funding for that because even at the highest end uh, drama documentary, uh, you're talking about half a million per hour, which uh, again has issues with tax, etc., and so on and so forth. Um, so. Uh, it's not so much it's fragmented, it's, it's non-existent really uh, from, from the television industry right now. I note, uh, Sajid, in Caledonian TV's written evidence, you, you make that point, but you also make the point that uh, not, you believe Northern Ireland screen are far more sympathetic to factual programming, and we went on a fact-finding visit to Northern Ireland where we met Northern Ireland screen and a factual uh, independent production company who, who were very complimentary about the support they got from Northern Ireland screen. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's co-production is another area which um, uh, we'd like to kind of uh, focus here on something which uh, I want to bring, bring to the table here because there's not a lot of um, factual uh, companies in Scotland that do it, but it's a, it's a big area. We've realised through the years that in terms of diversity of the, 
the, the places you go to, um, uh, going to uh, for network commissions, etc., uh, is becoming more and more very, very competitive, especially the number of startups that are happening now. So we've looked at international co-production, and um, we've had success in Australia, in Germany, in uh, and in Ireland, more recently more in Ireland and even Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, the companies that we've co come across in Ireland as well as Northern Ireland, um, ha even when we've brought um, IP to the table, it's been our idea um, because of the lack of uh, funding here. The only source of funding here for um, non-script or even uh, say drama documentary um, here has been from the broadcaster itself, from BBC Scotland. Um, there isn't any other opportunity to bring in money, whereas in Ireland, for example, they've got the BAI who give quite a lot of funding. In Northern Ireland, it's the same. And then also on top of that, they bring a huge slice um, from the tax uh, um, uh, relief uh, um, uh, uh, system. Um, so in the end, when we've done co-production, um, we have had to actually give over um, um, not only our IP, but all the production has been predominantly done in Ireland. Um, and with Irish staff and Irish crew, um, and on top of that, uh, when you come to the back end, if there's anything to be made in the back end, um, again, because you've brought very little to the table in the first place, you get a smaller slice from that, so ongoing revenue is, is limited as well. Okay. Uh, Lauren and Grant, did you want to come in on this general question about funding before we move on? No. Um, for me, Tartan Features is a collective of individual, so I'm only going to be speaking individually for the films I've made through that, and our levels of funding are exceptionally low, they can be between a thousand and a hundred thousand pounds. The problem that I've been facing with funding is that, because our levels are so small, we've been able to create the films ourselves, but it's actually getting the funding from Creative Scotland. Two films have received funding after they were completed, or 99% completed, um, and I could only access that funding through a producer who is incredibly helpful towards the film. Um, and the film eventually was screened on BBC and it has won awards at festivals, but I know, I can at least say I'm very certain that I wouldn't have been able to access that funding that we needed to get the film to the extra level which it needed without that help and to me I think there are many many people in the industry needing this funding who have the talent who've created the films who have the problem which I had was, was really the forms that you have through Creative Scotland um, and that's a problem for me and I think it's a problem for other people as well. Thank you very much I'll move on to Claire Baker now. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, I really wanted to probe a bit further on the screen unit. Um, I'm interested in the comments the panel have made around funding either being difficult and quite bureaucratic to access or not being focused in the areas where you feel funding should be. Do you have any... Um, first of all, are you, do you feel that you have knowledge and you're being kept informed of the progress of the screen unit? And do you feel you have any influence and the, the points you're raising today are being heard by Creative Scotland and the creation of the screen unit. Um, I, uh, several of us, uh, Nason and I and Arabella, who's going to speak later, are on IPS, and I think that's... Uh, we, the IPS have lobbied for the screen unit, and w IPS are um, uh, trying to input into the... We think it's very important that, that we have input into that, and... Uh, it's been, a, it's been real progress that, that the production sector has come together to thrash out our differences and to speak with one voice over the last three, four years. So um, we're very excited that there is going to be, we're talking about the, 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 the upcoming screen yes, unit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We're very um, excited that it's going to be happening and we want to, we're, we're meeting actually today to, um, to talk about our input into plans for that. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah, I think, um, Broadly, I am, uh, from again, o only from the Blazing Griffin perspective, very happy with um, the way things have progressed over the past two years, with um, uh, the way Creative Scotland has uh, manoeuvred within its own constraints to uh, provide flexible support. Um, and then now having listened to the um, industry, and I think the, uh, the proposal that's on the table is, uh, on the high level, it is a it answers many of the points, if not almost all of the points, that we, we have raised uh, over the past um, many years. The question in 
in terms of implementation is in the detail because that report can be, uh, the, the, the screen unit can do it in lots of different ways and it could be done in ways which, for example, completely ignore um, the micro budget feature uh, uh, segment of our industry which I personally think would be a big issue um, because I think it's one area where public funding uh, can be used really effectively to, to grow um, the market and, and the industry in Scotland. Um, and it could be used in a way which uh, supports inward investment uh, to a degree which then crowds out domestic producers um, from the local labour market, um, and or it could be done in a way that um, supports indigenous producers uh, really effectively and allows us to retain our intellectual property, which is actually where value will be for us, uh, for all of us, uh, in retaining intellectual property and having um, bundles of assets that, that um, uh, build over time. So, uh, yeah, I guess it's a very long-winded way of saying it, the intention seems great. Proof will be in the pudding. We are a part of the conversation, but it needs real detail. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a competitive market. There, we, there was a meeting um, a few weeks ago, uh, a con consultation about one of the funds um, that there's going to be getting input on it. And one of the producers there made the point that it's become a very competitive market for high-end drama, for example. And you know, uh, people around Europe are saying, oh, come here, shoot here, Australia. We'll give you these kinds of breaks. Ireland has been saying that. And I think the, the funds set up need to be in recognition of that. Uh, historically, Scottish Screen and then Creative Scotland have been very keen to have their money paid back, paid back first. Um, and maybe not. Uh, what we want is people to say, "Oh yes, let's let's co-produce with you and do it in Scotland because you have the advantages of these funds from Creative Scotland, of these tax breaks, of these things." We have not had that since the demise of Scottish Screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it then fair to say that while the Screen Unit has been announced and the first of April was a date that had been announced as it been established, we're now past that day, it's still fairly at implementation stage, that while you are clear on what it is you would like to see it do, nobody at this stage actually knows where it, what it will do. It doesn't, as you say, there's a high level, there's a, in principle, but when it comes to decisions on what type of funding is going to be available and who it's targeted at, we don't know that yet. We don't even know how much funding. Um, is that we, do know, we do know... We, we do know what the pot is, and I think they're establishing the parameters of the, th the funds at the moment, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we, we've been quite well informed in that, um, from, the, from the television perspective, in that, we, uh, that Caledonia sits on a TV working group, um, which um, uh, members of Creative Scotland have sat on, etc. And so we, we've got probably more access to um, actually shaping um, uh, what, what the screen uh, leadership group um, becomes. Um, so. But, but, but I mean, there's only about four or five independent companies that sit in that, and there's uh, you know about 40, 43 companies certainly uh, <coughs> that, um, uh, in Scotland at least uh, that members of, of of our trade industry pact. Um, so uh, there'll be a number of companies out there that will will not have been able to get to get that same access, um, and they have ex expressed that they want to develop uh, the whole area of television in a way that Creative Scotland couldn't do in the past. Mm -hmm. um, uh, However, I'm a little bit concerned in that um, reading a little, little bit into the, the reports that have come out and also uh, in, in some of the kind of uh, um, summary documents that TV doesn't seem to be getting much of a priority, although we have been told that they will have a, you know, a, a separate group. It requires a specialised group within there um, to look at the whole idea of television, which um, if you look at Scottish terms, actually, in terms of revenue, is one of the biggest uh, revenue uh, providers in Scotland, uh, and I think the biggest uh, companies in Scotland, those are t 10 million plus, um, are predominantly in that in that field. Um, so it's extremely important for them um, to, to really look at that. But it, it is a bit worrying that, yeah, it's, it's now t time marches on um, and uh, nothing specific has been established. I haven't heard anything more recently, but certainly in its initial stages when being set up, there were, uh, there were independent television producers that sat on the committee to, 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 to guide them. So we're quite happy from that perspective that um, <coughs> we had quite a wide uh, variety of members uh, uh, focused on discussion. Okay, thank you. Grant, did you want to come in? I read a 60-page report, and, and I know as much as I did before that I did after, um, <laughs> from reading a couple of newspaper articles. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> just, just on... <laughs> um, 
on on the point of implementation, I guess it is, I think, easy to look negatively at how change has been slow, and we've obviously had re recommendations over a year ago, and 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 um, uh, the screen unit's been created. On the flip side, there's so much learning to do as to how to best support, like. We call it the film and TV industry, but it's actually a whole bunch of different industries and different markets um, that all need different types of support. Um, none of us here like need the same products. Um, so I, I guess I, I principally don't have a problem with things taking time. If it looks like the consultation, the discovery, the experimentation even, which I realize is hard to do with public money. Um, it's hard to go, oh, well, we're just going to see how, how, if we put a little bit of money here, maybe we'll see what it does and then and then um, try something different fairly rapidly. But um, yeah, I guess I wouldn't take the length of time it takes to implement necessarily as a negative, provided what is going on underneath the surface is um, data-led and responsive and, and uh, tailored across all of our complex markets. Mm -hmm. No, because it was interesting, last week we did have, uh, sorry, not last week, but the last session we had, there was a bit of a discussion around the role of the state and of the public in a, what is a commercial and competitive um, environment. And I suppose some of the comments you made suggest, will the screen unit or can the public sector, there seems to be an element, there needs to be risk taken within this sector. Are we able to do that with public money? Um, but that is the environment that the film and TV sector seems to be working in. It is a competitive environment, and it's how these two merge. I know other members will raise questions around Scottish Enterprise, uh, which is where the enterprise business side sits, but the creative side still sits with Creative Scotland. And will the screen unit successfully bring these two together and be flexible enough to meet the needs of the sector? To keep t that we all keep talking. I think that's that's the problem. Is when you have people going off. Um, and uh, devising the structure of the new screen unit and uh, how much the jobs will be able to, without having input from the industry about what we need, which is why this is so great and important and why we're meeting and it, why the IPS is continuing to try to give input to the, the new screen unit and would rather that it took the time to get it right as well. Thank you. Um, Rachel Hamilton and Tavish Scott both wanted to come in. Is it both on the points that have been made? Um, Convener, it's actually on many points that have been made regarding Scottish Enterprise, if, if that's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, obviously there's, you know, from the evidence that we've been gathering from um, various evidence um, panels, um, Scottish Enterprise has come up numerous times. Um, it seems that uh, most of you know more than Scottish Enterprise um, and can tell them how to to actually uh, take forward a proposal. Um, there seems that there's a lack of experience and expertise within Scottish uh, enterprise. Um, I wanted to really discuss how um, you feel that Scottish enterprise can take forward um, the recommendations by the SSLG um, to support uh, the screen sector. And I'd like you to include um, other, other aspects such as data collection, um, and, and uh, the other um, aspects, such as the criteria that set particularly the turnover, the high turnover um, of the companies um, that Scottish Enterprise currently expect over 10 million, which only STV and IWC can actually um, meet. And I think it's a 4 million. So I think it's just an open discussion, really, of how we can meet the recommendations for the SSLG. Enterprise. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I guess I have um, the most experience working with Scottish Enterprise. Um, I, I think the um, what the SSLG recommended, I think, is right. That I think working in partnership um, with uh, Create Scotland and the other support um, supporting bodies in Scotland is probably the only way that it can work. Uh, the Film and, to a certain extent, television companies, but to a much lesser extent, um, film companies c can't get to the place of critical mass of the capacity of access to capital that makes uh, makes it traditionally supported by Scottish Enterprise. Uh, we received support from them well before um, we uh, <coughs> uh, hit. We haven't hit 10 million turnover sadly yet. You know, next year, but uh, they helped us. Um, with the seed investment rounds, they co-invested. Uh, prior to that, they were helping with 
development and training. Uh, they've co-invested on a Series A round and have supported us through it um, through that entire process uh, in lots of different ways as well. So, um, for me, it's a question of if we're the exception, wh why is that? Um, how can we learn from our one data points? Because I'm I'm not sure if we are the single exception, but uh, it, regardless, it'll be a few points of data. Um, for me, the uh, the question is really in uh, building capacity, and how can Scottish enterprise in in uh, in potential remit to um, create a sustainable um, industry and market in Scotland um, with companies that are self-sustaining and don't have to continually uh, continually rely on subsidy. Um, what does it take to get there? And I think it's a raft of different things. Um, part, a huge part of it is, is capacity building. What does it mean to um, talk to investors about different ways of investing in your company or in your product? Like it, that, that, that's just knowledge. That's not... Um, it doesn't need money. Uh, I guess it's money in terms of time and training, but it's, it's not more than that. So having a, re a lower level to be able to access that kind of funding um, and that kind of support, uh, I think, uh, would be re is really important. Um, I, I think I, I can't see really um, in the current system and not knowing enough of the detail about the intentions going forward how Scottish Enterprise could... Um, more directly invest in more film and TV companies, uh, given that they really need to be investable propositions. So the question is how we get there. And I think working with Creative Scotland, um, whose key remit is in, you know, it isn't creative, but it's in intellectual property. That's what our assets are, right? So if the focus is, okay, how do we build intellectual property? How do we build it so that the profits are flowing back to the companies? Um, that I can then go, okay, well, the valuation of this company is X. How, how there's the creative and um, really film-specific aspect to that, which is Creative Scotland's expertise, and there's a lot of different ways that it can support at the different stages, the different types of market failure I think we have in Scotland, and then working in conjunction with Scottish Enterprise to go, at the same time, we're building the business capacity to then be able to take that to the point where it's either investable or at least proves that there is sustainable um, growth. In just just on that point, I noticed that the, the PAC study had um, suggested that Scottish Enterprise had supported uh, 100 businesses, of which 50% had actually failed. So there's clearly um, something that's not right there, and you use the word sustainable. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by capacity, uh, mm. in the sense that, um, are you saying that uh, you, you want Scottish Enterprise to actually uh, create or find the um, potential opportunities um, so that you can then get funding to actually take that through with perhaps international cooperation? Um, I personally don't look at the role of the state to find opportunities for us. I think that is our job uh, as the private sector. Um, I think uh, what we can, uh, what, the way I look at it is that if because of um, the uh, status of the international market, our lack of competitiveness with it, or at least our lack of ability to get to critical mass to be able to compete internationally, um, what that means is looking at the, I guess, the real specifics of what it takes to do that. So in the film uh, world, that can be creative development of projects to an international standard. So that is having the skills and ability to really make sure you're developing television shows and films and all of that that are going to be able to compete internationally. That's just raw, that's skills that can be learned and developed over time. Okay. Um, that if we don't have it indigenously, we need to look at ways of, of, of bringing in those skills and then disseminating them. Okay. Uh, it can also be, um, for, for us, how do, you, um, how do you make productions efficient so that I can... I can physically be able to do two productions a year because that's what I, as a, as a film company, need to be able to do to become sustainable and have uh, built enough of a back catalogue of intellectual property that I can know that that income is going to see me through times when um, there are market shocks. Um, okay. Thank you, Nathan. I, I think I need, I'm running yeah. out of time, so I would just want to hear from some of the other panellists. It's just, it's just it, you know, I... I, I uh, the, I can't teach Scottish Enterprise how to support, 
support, support my industry when I'm very focused on keeping going as a production company. And in the early days, we did get support from Scottish Enterprise. Our experience, and I'm sure you've heard it, is that they the, the, the eyes light up when you see video games and stuff from um, Scottish Enterprise uh, executives, but um, it, it, they really have found it hard to understand the nature of our industry, the hit or miss agency. So, so I, I am, very, as, a, as a production team, very focused on trying to get the projects underway rather than figuring out how Scottish Enterprise can support them because we, ha we have, uh, by and large, given up on them um, for support. TV perspective, um, again, the lifeblood of any te television company is development and developing uh, a lot of ideas at a time and keeping those uh, relationship with commissioning editors. And in the past, our production budgets um, from television have been high enough that we've been able to sustain a small team of development people of three to four people. Uh, that's no longer the case. Uh, production budgets are constantly being slashed right down and down and down uh, to, the, to the point now where we, we can barely afford one person in development um, in, in our team and the rest of us try and pitch in whenever we can. So um, for support in that area, it's extremely important. And our point is that it has happened in the past. There was, I mean, we, we mentioned it in our submission um, that there was a scheme um, called uh, the um, Creative Industries Development Programme uh, early 2000s in which we received money uh, was match funding towards getting a development individual who happened to be based in London. And again, the flexibility of being able to do that was, was really useful. And our turnaround was trebled within 18 months uh, to over a million. Um, and uh, we were able to work across the network of productions. That allowed actually our staff to go down to London and work on, on uh, formatted and featured programming uh, for them to get experience in that and develop uh, in a way that wouldn't have been possible. Um, uh, and by the way, the Scottish crew were a, a lot better and, and, and more um, uh, uh, did a lot better than, than the London um, um, uh, freelancers. So that kind of system worked for us in the past, and we'd like to see something of that nature being introduced again because we really think it can be a benefit to television production companies here. There was also a co-investment fund that actually uh, Scotch Green invested in an, a documentary. And again, we're talking about lower ends. We're talking about 150,000 per hour, uh, approximately. Um, and uh, invested in, in, in a specific production um, uh, and with investment from the broadcaster ITV and investment also from an, an, an angel investor in London. So it was a tripartite agreement. And that production uh, was, has became one of our biggest selling international uh, productions uh, around the world um, because of the nature of, of, of the documentary. Um, so those kind of funds have helped in the past, and it, but, it, but when you're talking about early 2000s, those were around, they're no longer there. Um, that's one aspect which we'd like to see kind of being brought back, back in again and looking at the past and see how those things have been successful for Scottish in, uh, in, indie companies. The other aspect is the whole aspect of inward investment of production companies in Scotland. And this is where um, uh, we find we're at a disadvantage uh, in that if there are companies that are uh, from England who already ha have... Uh, actually quite a lot of backing in the first place, come into Scotland, they can get quite large grants uh, to helping them towards, uh, which, which is fine, but it's not a level playing field. If we were to try and, and get a similar kind of investment, it wouldn't be there because we are already uh, in Scotland. Um, so I and, and from the back of that, again, it's not an issue. Um, it's, it's great getting more companies and et cetera that will provide more jobs, and there have been companies that have been very good at that. Sadly, I think it's very few. I think a lot of them have set up, have either collapsed, have gone, gone by the wayside, or have, haven't really established the Scottish base properly. So I'd like to see more data analysis of how that investment funding has actually benefited Scotland uh, and Scottish crew and Scottish people, because I talk to people a lot in the crewing, the crewing sector and, and uh, uh, the freelance uh, industry okay. there. And it doesn't seem as if a lot of work is coming the way from those type of companies. Thank you. Uh, convener, I know Lorne wanted to come, come in. in. There's very little evidence that Scottish Enterprise are a willing participant in this industry. I don't think they like it. I don't think they like the speed it works at. They don't, they don't like the business model. Um, and, and I think <coughs> there's a case for really reviewing their involvement in it. Okay. This, the screen unit continues to give Scottish Enterprise a role in developing uh, larger companies. Uh, I take it from what you're saying is that's probably not a very good idea. Well, um, it's not really my level of ex my area of expertise, mm. but uh, as I say, there's, there's, there's just no evidence of interest. Um, Scottish Enterprise focus on specific industries with specific outcomes. This industry operates in a completely different way. It's so project-based. Um, and, and I think what you heard is people are looking for, somebody said, two projects a year to keep them going. Um, and, and 
that just doesn't it just doesn't compute with Scottish Enterprise. I mean, I, th I think they're like a fish out of water. Yeah. Um, of being a smaller company and uh, sadly no one near the 10 million threshold, let alone uh, the 5 million, um, is that, uh, again, we haven't been accounts managed by uh, Scot uh, 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 Scottish Enterprise for some time now because we're way under the threshold. Um, and what we what we found is is that, well, the, 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 by far the majority of companies in Scotland are nowhere near that threshold and then therefore to focus on growing companies to be above 10 million, um, which is which is good. That's fine, but there should also be a focus on growing smaller companies uh, to to a lesser degree. So, if, I don't know, companies of less than a million up to five million, etc. And that should be a focus as well. Given if you look at, I mean, I can only go by our um, um, our, our our lobbying group pact. Um, we have 43 members uh, in Scotland, and uh, I would say uh, only as only two members um, are uh, above 10 million. Uh, again, both who have uh, either broadcast behind them or have a huge international uh, company behind them in the case of IW IWC. Um, and uh, uh, we just think that's not necessarily the, the, the most balanced uh, way forward. Okay. I'm afraid we've only got 20 minutes left and we've got several mm -hmm. other members that want to come in. Um, and so if I could ask questions and answers to be as brief as possible. Tavi Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, the logic of the arguments you've made this morning about funding surely is that we have a one-stop shop, and that is Scottish Screen. Isn't that what you're really arguing? I, I can't. Look, I entirely take uh, Mr. Boswell's point. I can't see the logic of Scottish Enterprise being involved at all. So why not? What should we not be arguing? Take the funding pot away from Scottish Enterprise, give it to the new organisation, and make sure that organisation is properly staffed and properly resourced. You can answer yes. Mm. Yes. Second question. Um, uh, thank you for that, because that's kind of where I am on it. Uh, the second question is, in some earlier evidence we got in this committee, in terms of the board of the new Scottish screen, uh, it was suggested that uh, your industry across the different uh, the different areas that you've described this morning should be represented, probably on a rotating basis. So, you, so you should, we should take uh, clever people that are in your industry, put them on the board for three years, make them make decisions, then get them back out into the private sector. We're all clever. Yeah, <laughs> I don't doubt it for a minute. Would you accept that model because of the industry's need to actually con uh, be in charge? Yes, although it takes a bit of time to make any impact on a board, so not a rotating. Um, not yeah. all at the same time. Yeah, right? not not every yeah. year, but yeah, sure. yeah. No, I, I absolutely think we should be on the board. Okay. Producers should be on the board. The independent production sector should be on the board. Yeah, and would that work for television as well? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Richard Lockhead. So, yeah, it's, so. been, <laughs> it's been asked. I'm not sure I'm asked to ask the question, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, if the convener and Tavish Scott basically covered the points I was going to raise. I, I, I will just maybe elaborate the point that Tavish made, which is, um, are you comfortable, given what you've said, because there seems to be zero confidence in Scottish enterprise from the industry, from all the panels we've heard from, uh, that there should be a continuing role for Scottish enterprise post the screen unit being set up, or do you think it should just all be merged into one film agency for Scotland? I think if you want to see the potential that the, the industry has in Scotland, I think you need one body to lead on it. Um, uh, and I think Scottish Enterprise, as I say, they just don't look like a willing participant. So they potentially have a lot to bring to the table, but they're choosing not to. Um, again, because of the business model, is, is my interpretation. They just don't like, you know, two projects a year rather than a factory that's going to produce, you know, X widgets and, 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 uh, and therefore Y profit. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think... Um, I, th I think your instincts that we're picking up are, are, are correct. <coughs> the, only, uh, the only thing I'd, I'd modify it with is, provided that the um, that body does have expertise in um, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, like business, I guess, um, which yeah. is something that Great Scotland doesn't have, yes. rightly so. So that, yeah, that's my only. I, I mean, uh, absolutely. I think um, uh, the, the area of, if, of specialism is important, as I say, trying to understand the industry and the nuances of each of the areas are, um, are, are important, so perhaps it would be better served if it was more specialised under one group. However, I mean, to, to, to give you an idea, just come back to the whole widget production um, kind of concept, um, Scotland is, sorry, uh, Scottish Enterprises, you know, covers a huge breadth of, of uh, um, organisations and businesses uh, across, uh, across Scotland. Um, and recently, for example, they, they've embarked on a business development program within the media industry, I think it's called Focus, um, and they've um, employed, um, I don't know if maybe Blaise and Griffin are on it, or, uh, but um, they've employed um, consultants from, from London um, to do 
in business development. And our experience of it again is that, to be honest with you, those kind of general consultants, whilst they may be fantastic for, um, I don't know, a widget production company, um, what we find is um, when we've had that kind of, uh, uh, or needed that kind of business development, we've benefited much more from smaller schemes. We have a, we've had a specialist mentor. Uh, we recently got funding from uh, Can Gale, uh, a Scottish-Irish Gaelic fund, uh, for a mentor to be with us for 12 months, um, and we were able to choose that mentor, and uh, who was uh, an, uh, an ex-commissioning editor, someone who's got an independent company in London, um, and they were able to give us phenomenal advice over a 12-month period, um, and that kind of uh, growth development in terms of that was much, much more useful. Uh, than, than we th I think would be than having a, a, a large consultancy firm um, who are more generic. Okay, thanks. Um, Ross Green. Thanks, Peter. Um, one final point on governance issues around the screen unit before moving on. Um, as it's currently constituted within Creative Scotland, it will have its own board, but it will ultimately be answerable to the board of Creative Scotland, which naturally will never have anything close to a majority of uh, individuals on it from your industry, your industry's plural. Um, so to take it one step further from what's al already been asked, would it make more sense for the screen unit to be an independent standalone agency, which feels like going back in time a little bit, um, or uh, does it make sense for this to be contained within Creative Scotland still? I, I would say yes. And, I, and one of the reasons is because our industry is very different from uh, the other things that yes. Creative Scotland does. And, that's the, you know, and that was what we said was going to happen uh, at the demise of Scottish Screen. That's what did happen. And there was tremendous uh, difficult... You, you, you absent the screen industry, there's tremendous competition and dissatisfaction between the artistic community in Scotland and Creative Scotland it just uh, finding its feet as a, as, as a, as a funding body and uh, we, I, I, we would rather not be involved in that because, be, because our industry is different, needs different things and has different economic potential from the other subsidised arts in Scotland. So yes, absolutely. The Travel, <coughs> that, that, that it, it'll start off, I mean we are where we are, it'll start off as an independent unit but it really wouldn't surprise me if, if within a period of time it became totally independent. Um, and to, to move on to another area then, uh, just because we've got very little time remaining, um, there has been quite a bit of discussion around what the, the unit, whether it does end up separate or not, um, how, how we balance priorities between indigenous production and trying to uh, attract larger scale international production to Scotland. How do you think the new unit, what, what role should the new unit be playing in getting that kind of balance? But as much as I think we would like to be able to, to be the kind of country that attracts substantial amounts of large-scale international production, our bread and butter for the foreseeable future will not be that. It will be indigenous production. So how do we strike that balance? B both. But other screen units around Europe, if, they, if they're offering you money, uh, a production to come into their country, will insist that you use a local producer, that there is, a, a, in partnership, that there is benefit and consistent benefit after the production leaves to the independent sector within that country. And that's what we haven't done. Um, so I would say that's a very important part of it. You know, and just from my own point of view as a TV company, we're consistently asked to, I am consistently asked to help develop a project. We've got a young writer. We're a London comedy company. There's only a handful of companies that specialize in comedy, for example. Um, we want you to help develop this project for Channel 4, for, uh, for BBC. But there would be, if, we, if I was able to say, if you do it in partnership with my company, we can access these funds from the new screen unit. That's, that's the kind of thing that builds an industry. There has been no requirement to, to uh, help production companies as you exploit their talents and resources. That's, that's been the problem. And he's absolutely right, but uh, I think you put your finger on the, 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 dile the, the dilemma that, um, uh, that this new body is going to have, that the two things are not necessarily compatible, uh, and trying to, trying to knit them up is, is actually very difficult, but that's obviously um, one way of doing it that we've not avail us, availed ourselves of previously. But the, the, the inward, you know, the, the, the location Scotland, as opposed to growing the indigenous, uh, are, are two different things. But, but the insistence on the use of local talent, and, and I'm, I'm going to put in a special plea here for front of ca camera talent as well, because that's who I represent. Um, you know, I, I think that's just been sadly missing. So what, ha 
And what's happened is some, somebody might get some, some money to come here in, in some way, shape or form, use Location Scotland, but they're still flying up the day players, not the, not the principals, not, not, not the, the names that get the commission, but the, but the day flying up the day players from London. And I think that's just a thing that should be, should be relegated to the past. We should commit ourselves to using local talent. Um, if we're using public money in Scotland, a major commitment to using local talent front and behind the camera. <coughs> Point when you you know just in reviewing the documents before this, they, they're, they're, you, you talk about going to Northern Ireland and seeing the success there, and going to Ireland. You know we could actually do better because there is no great show set in Belfast that's that's produced by a. a, a company, a Northern Irish company. There's no great show set in Dublin. The show that I'm doing at the moment is set in Dublin. It's Sharon Horgan's company has had just tremendous growth just in the past few years. And it's remarkable to think that for all the support the industry has had from the Irish sector, that they've never had uh, a, an ongoing drama set in Dublin that we could all refer to or be familiar with. We could do that in Scotland. We have the talent here. We have the locations here. So to actually aim higher than those other, than those other countries. I would say, rather than the one-off big um, uh, scripted uh, you know, drama, etc., which is which is which is good, I would say sometimes a little bit of uh, red carpet fever, uh, as we call it uh, within the, with the TV industry. The things that really grow the TV companies here, and the, the real golden goose for us is re returnable series. Uh, you know, is your kind of. Yeah, uh, which again, if you look at the two biggest companies, they've both both got returnable series over the last um, a number of years here, and that's what can really grow a company in in, in any big way. But that's not high end production; that's kind of uh, 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 mass, so it's a number of different uh, uh, um, da you know, daily productions over a number of years, uh, and that's really what can grow a company and, and push into a development and uh, getting uh, becoming bigger and bigger. So that would be where we would say the other area, of course, for us anyway, that we've seen success in is uh, co-production, so international co-production. Uh, different markets, we you can go to other countries, and again, that's where we would say it has there has to be much, much more. Uh, we haven't really been able to invest further in that so so far because what we've found is every time we've done it, we haven't been able to bring enough money back to the table. So we come back to that. The, the, the tax breaks that other countries bring in, whether it be Ireland, Australia, Canada, everyone we've work, worked with, or whether it be the public funding that's available for uh, lower end production, because the, the, I mean, there, there is I've never come across uh, even in high end. Uh, scripted uh, drama documentary, anything that comes close to a million pound an hour, um, where, uh, whereas in in, in uh, the BAI and in Ireland, etc., it's a much lower threshold and they bring much more. So we'd say co-production is very important to growing the industry and also getting uh, um, uh, putting in development towards helping towards getting returnable series, uh, more returnable series to, to companies will certainly grow companies here in a big way. Two points. Um, I agree with everything that the, the panel said um, thus far. I think um, two additional things. The um, inward investment, as it's, it's sometimes called, in terms of the buying of our goods and services um, by a, a non-domestic um, producer is great, but it, at the moment we don't have, great, we don't have um, a huge supply of labour for film and TV. So it's very easy for that to then mean that crews um, become, and other services um, are out of the price range of domestic producers. So that means for me that a renewed focus on training and development, um, which frankly will take a long time. It's gonna take two or three years to ensure that we have enough crews to be able to, if we put a real focus on bringing um, uh, foreign companies to come and make things here, which is great. Um, but in terms of keeping that balance, I think that's incredibly important uh, that we have trained enough crew. Uh, and um, the other part of it in terms of ensuring a balance and, and really going from um, uh, a lot of small scale producers to a few, a few um, to, to having just that bit more experience and able to compete internationally is where um, the funding doesn't really, um, isn't really targeted at the moment and that is, in a big way, what Grant does, which is allowing people who are first-time producers, directors, um, to move from making things that are purely cultural output, like short films that have no commercial value, to making something that does have potentially commercial value. And that is the riskiest part. That's when the market doesn't want to invest money. And that is where the role of the state can be really meaningful. And it's not a lot of money. As you heard from Grant, between 1,000 and 100,000 for something um, which can, can make an industry in a lot of ways. Um, 
And, uh, and then final point being, uh, I think the same thing applies for increased funding to short films to then increase talent coming through that. Which I absolutely agree with you, Nason, but that's one of the things that the new network is potentially a absolutely. platform for what, so I'm more excited about the new network than anything and the potential that could have for, um, for an outlet for the, for the kind of work that you're talking about, which would make such a difference to makers. I agree with all of Nathan's points. My bread and butter comes from being a crew member, so I benefit from a service industry, essentially. But I think the film industry is cyclical, and I think we have to be very careful why companies are coming to the UK. And if you read Alexander Walker's books on 60s, 70s film industry, you know, we have great crew members, but overnight, once investment leaves, we could be left with just lots of crew members in the industry. So it's absolutely essential we grow an indigenous film industry and you know as Nathan was saying um, I think micro budget feature films are a great way to do that it's more cultural but they can have economic benefits one of the films which was made through Tartan Features one of the filmmakers went on to a film with Nathan um, after that and it's become incredibly successful and they're both going to do more successful things so it can work um, and it's a great way for allowing something cultural and interesting to feed into the larger part of the film industry. It's scalable, and I think we have to focus efforts on creating an indigenous film industry because, while it's great, you know, at the moment everyone's making a lot of money being crew members. Um, if that goes, we're going to be left with lots of crew members and no films. Yeah, it takes one writer's strike in America, and that's it. Stuart McMillan, did you want to come in? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, certainly, this area kind of touched upon that's uh, something that uh, uh, Equity had in their submission. Mr Boswell, in your submission, it states that the screen sector is London-centric and there's a danger of Scottish public investment ending up in London. Uh, do you think with this new proposal uh, that that can actually start to change and more of that money will stay in Scotland? I hope so. There's no, there's no reason why it can't, but but it, it, it needs it needs joined up thinking. Um, you know, one of the one of the biggest players, obviously, here is the BBC, uh, and, and the, the the BBC for years has been, um, far, well, I think, since the time of John Burt, has been incredibly London centric. He centralised all decision making in London. Pr prior to him being the the director general, the, the the powers that be up here had the ability to commission programmes, you know, for for, for for broadcast. That that seems to have been lost. Uh, and even the, the the commissioners that they've had up here have really, uh, it's really been a career move for them to get some power and then they've gone back down to London. So so the, the industry is London-centric. I mean, that, that's, uh, that I think is a statement of fact. Uh, and I think uh, I think it's in everybody's interest that we that we do as much as we can to, to re-gear that, to make sure that there's as much autonomy within Scotland as we can. And I think having a, a, a powerful independent screen unit, and, and I sense that this screen unit will be more powerful than Scottish Screen was, um, uh, I, I think is, is, is a big step in, uh, uh, in achieving that. Uh, and a second question is applied to Mr McHale. Um In your submission, uh, you state that the, the UK tax credit system does not benefit factual TV, so a reform of that system is much needed. I mean, is that a, a suggestion? Is that something that, uh, uh, that others in the panel actually agree with? And would you like to elaborate on that particular it, it, It's aspect? specific to our area in terms of uh, non-scripted uh, is, is lower budgets. So I don't know in terms of uh, a scripted whether a million pound an hour is something which is um, uh, commonplace. Um, but uh, certainly in our industry, it's, it, it isn't. And every time we've done international co-productions, I've mentioned in Ireland, etc., um, they have always been able to bring the lion's share in from actually from from the tax system. Um, I, I know it's a complicated issue, and it's not something that can be solved at a local level. Um, however, it's something that should be looked into because at the moment, in terms of from from our industry, the, which is by far the majority, even the sort of big highest end kind of drama documentary that we might make. Uh, wouldn't come close. You see, you're talking three to four hundred thousand, I mean, half a million at the, at the very most. So, it, you immediately are at a disadvantage whenever you go to co-production co internationally, and hence you're left with only one pot funding, which is the broadcaster. And then, what that means is companies from Ireland, companies from Canada, can go direct to the broadcaster and say, Do "You know what? We'll make it ourselves." Um, we have to have a certain amount of Irish um, a crew on, we have to have a certain amount of films because of our funding. Uh, we don't even have to use a local, um, uh, we don't, don't even have to do a co-production with a local company, we can just go direct to the broadcaster. Uh, uh, so that is a, a, a huge hole as far as we're concerned and it could be, it could be quite a big revenue 
uh, generator for Scotland if, if that was looked into specifically. Um, we believe, and certainly from the non-scripted drama documentary perspective. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any comments on that area? Uh, and just my final question, it's um, uh, obviously we heard from yourselves in terms of uh, what you would like to see happen uh, uh, with this unit, with it, be, with it being a standalone proposal as compared to what is being proposed. Uh, but Scottish Enterprise uh, clearly has that overarching economic uh, aspect, uh, <coughs> overarching Scottish economic aspect. Um, so if uh, you were to get what you wanted with a, a standalone unit, how do you, uh, what type of role would you see Scottish Enterprise actually playing at some point in the future to assist with, uh, with your sector? I, I, I think the, the biggest game changer for the industry would be a returning drama, three returning dramas uh, fostered on the new network potentially going out on BBC One or BBC Two. Th that, there would be a great role for Scottish Enterprise to play in supporting, when, you know, look at what Outlander has in Cumbernauld for all the facilities needed for something, the way that we had when we had Taggart. If we had something that was partially studio-based, that had a returning cast, there's plenty of investment opportunities there to support the ongoing series. And when it, when it, when a network decides to do something, it does it. You know, BBC Scotland decided they wanted a soap. They got a soap. The new network needs to, to decide that it wants a, re a returning series by the Scottish production sector. That's, and if, if we have that, there will be plenty of, from, from my point of view, there would, that would be an opportunity for Scottish enterprise to be involved in supporting that because the, 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 the funding will be low. We will, we, we will have a low um, uh, per hour budget for the new network. But that's a, an ideal opportunity to grow something and to develop something, to bring in writers, to bring in actors. You know, just, just having River City, how many actors have had an opportunity for work in Scotland without having to travel to London? We so need that. We so need um, things that are made here that you can rely that they're going to be made next year because the network has gotten behind it. And <coughs> we're going to develop the series and we're going to make it better, these three series that we're making that are all... That, that, I mean, that's, that should be the number one priority of, of the new network and to be joined up with the screen unit and there'll be plenty of opportunity for Scottish Enterprise to support that. I think on, on the higher end, there's also use, we can make use of their expertise when it comes to, um, and, and this is looking ahead, things like mergers and acquisitions, facilitating and sourcing foreign direct investment in media companies uh, and joint ventures, the, the kind of stuff that isn't necessarily relevant to our stage as an infant industry, but will become more relevant, ideally, um, that, uh, as we grow. Um, as well as helping increase exports, internationalization, I think those kind of things fall pretty squarely within the remit of, of Scottish enterprise, and they have expertise in those those areas. But how we um, how we get to the point where we can make use of those expertise, I think a standalone um, unit that has uh, some input from Scottish enterprise would be really positive. Okay. All right, thank you. Can I just co cover a couple of areas that haven't perhaps been covered in, <coughs> in depth? I mean, a Annie talked about the importance of, of the new BBC network. Um, the role of the broadcasters is something that perhaps we haven't uh, looked at. How important is the role of the broadcasters in Scotland and the BBC in particular? And what are your views of the current Ofcom uh, review of the Out of London criteria? Um, how, how would you change that? Um, Absolutely. You know, we were when when IPS first started up, we were very focused on Creative Scotland and getting Creative Scotland um, more supportive of the screen industry and Scottish enterprise. And then we realised a few years ago, it was it was the discussions around the licence renewal and the BBC and looking into what the spend was. I did the keynote address at the 2015 Industry Days of the Glasgow Film Festival, and so I spent ages. Uh, going through the material, and it is really shocking. 55% of the money raised is a, is a generous estimate. I think that's outrageous. When, when um, uh, Lauren talked about the centralization under John Burt, it's actually under drama. There's been a tremendous centralization under the previous head of, uh, two, two heads of drama ago, of, of the uh, D taking power away from regional drama commissioners. So there has yeah. been no... Can I just intervene yeah, there? Because we had them here two weeks ago 
and we put that point to them and they were absolutely adamant that they had a drama commissioner in Scotland who was do, do you know, I met with the head of business after uh, a year ago, I met with the head of business affairs of the BBC oh. and, I, and I was talking to my colleagues before saying, what's the most important thing to ask them? And they said, is there a decision maker in Scotland? Is there, can you green light something in Scotland? And I asked them boy, that point blank and he laughed. He went, oh, no, no. But you see, the great thing is that now we've got this person so that the BBC exec is, you know, so there's communication between the London head and the, the Scottish head. And you, it, it's unbelievably patronising that we don't have, you know, in, in a country that has uh, the, the, the skills and the, the, you know, that Sigma can get a Netflix commission and can't get a BBC drama commission. You know, it's outrageous. But there's, we, we it, it's just a constant battle to be part of the inner circle in London. And you can understand it when you get close to it, that there's this huge amount of money, huge amount of pressure. We've got to have a hit. We've got to have a hit. And you stay, you keep everything close to you. You don't want to green light something by somebody you see once every six months because they fly down from Glasgow to have a meeting with you. It's just, it's very difficult to get anything through. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think things have changed. I really don't. The one... The one, there's a, uh, uh, there, STV got a commission from BBC Drama and Claire Mundell got the, got the commission. And, uh, you know, having worked at the BBC, I don't see anybody who doesn't have insider knowledge of the BBC getting any commission out of BBC Drama. Um, you, you force them. You say, if, if, if we only, we'll give you 55% of our license fee if you're only spe spending 55% of the money here. That's, or, or devolution of, of the BBC. That's the only way forward because it has not changed. Mm -hmm. Is that true, Nason? Is sorry. I was going to say, if you, if you get if you get the BBC in front of you again, ask them what what commissions that individual can make, and and the the answer is they can do nothing. No. They, they can they have the, yeah. they they're entirely dependent on on someone in London to, to green light. It's like a, it's like a series of parallel gates. You've got to get through the you've got to get through the the first gate in in Scotland. Then you've got to hope that your idea is still current and vibrant and, and alive. And then you hope for the other gate to open, and then you can go through. But the chances are that you know something happens in between, and, and the second gate never opens. So th there's there's a there's a there's a real logjam there for for um, co commissioning. C can I just sorry? Can I just talk about the out of London uh, definition? Yeah. Because I think that's absolutely key. Ofcom used to produce a list of all all television productions and where they were assigned to, and if you ever, ever have a chance to look at that list, they now make it harder to find because it, it is a piece of Alice in Wonderland. Just, uh, I mean, it's just absolutely crazy. Um, it, so the definition um, uh, arise, arises from where the production spend is, where the, where the majority of the crew come from, um, where the post-production is, where the producer's based, but it excludes what happens in front of the camera. So, you know, so productions that have been... Uh, the, the, there was a production I was, I was talking to someone about just beforehand. I, f I forget his name. I think it was a year in the Hebrides. Um, and, and it, it was a production about the Hebridean landscape and, so, and, and a man went to live there with his dog and, and it was absolutely stunning. That was a South East of <coughs> England production because that's where the production spent was. Um, Gavin and Stacey, you would have thought that would be either um, you know, South East of England or it would be Wales. I, I think it was Midlands. I think it came out as Midlands. So, uh, I mean, this is complete Alice in Wonderland. If Ofcom can bring some clarity to, to where a production's based and including the front of camera spend, I think will be a big part of that, then I, th I think the whole idea will be much more credible. But I would urge you to let, lend your shoulder to, to, to the argument to say, let's have total um, spend rather than excluding uh, what actually what, what the viewers actually see um, uh, in, in their definition of, uh, of an out of London production. Do you think that we should uh, <coughs> Ofcom, and indeed actually to extend that to the new screen unit and now how it um, awards its uh, funding, should we be looking to places like France and Canada who certainly when I speak to programme makers tell me it's very, very tough, the criteria, and if you're going to get money out of those countries, you absolutely need to... Uh, use uh, writers and well, uh, I think we, we, we were hearing about the Republic of Ireland. Um, you know, uh, yes, uh, in, in a word, I think I think we should we should be championing the, the skills and, and, and the talents that live here. From our perspective, from, from the perspective of actual um, uh, Ofcom, have been up to, to, to Glasgow actually and, and talked to a number of producers here, etc., which is a really good start. Uh, and there were some things that there were that we had a really good discussion um, uh, about how they should take that forward. So we are actually very hopeful that. They'll, that they'll tighten up those definitions uh, to avoid any kind of uh, further um, uh, fiascos. Um, the B, from the BBC perspective, I mean, it's it's fantastic. We've got this opportunity now uh, of the new network, and it's great. This money is coming for the for the new channel, etc. 
um, uh, but it is incredibly uh, competitive. Uh, the, the, new, the last few rounds that have been there, it's, it's taken them months just to come back with uh, um, a year and a regarding ideas, so it's not an, an, an easy hit. And I would say it's a good start. It's fantastic that additional 20 million or so has come into to Scotland, but it doesn't even begin to make up for the uh, disparity of, of the uh, licence fee uh, spent here, which should really bring in, if we're to get up to uh, Northern Ireland levels, uh, you know, another 80 odd million or thereabouts. And if, if that kind of thing was, was, was uh, lobbied and pushed for, uh, that would really grow the industry as a whole over Scotland, whether it's in drama, whether it's in scripted, and I'll, I'll look for bigger bigger budgets for a starter as well for, to, for, for, for drama, etc. So it's excellent, it's a good start. Uh, I mean, we found the BBC, um, our, our experience of it is, is similar in some ways in that it, obviously it's very much London-centric, they've obviously tried to break out to other regions. Um, we have found this this whole issue of uh, commissioning executives uh, up here that have been, uh, that come up here to Glasgow or are based in Glasgow. Um, being the middle person, fortunately, though, so when it comes to actual real decisions, actually sometimes it goes back to the cat channel controller sometimes for just something as simple as a one-hour documentary. So um, sadly, it's it's not as they don't have as much power as we'd like them to have, and I think uh, certainly uh, the Scottish Green Leadership Group, whoever takes this forward, uh, should have a, um, a, 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 a bigger power in sort of lobbying for uh, uh, creative powers to be invested in the regions and more uh, uh, production spend happening up here in Scotland. And, and you'll also know about the move to uh, bid for the uh, second home for Channel 4, which I think would be a really significant thing. And I, I really don't see how it couldn't be in Scotland. Which we were talking about, there was a group meeting uh, to, to discuss this, that it be a Scottish bid with a Glasgow base. That, that would be the idea. Um, and in the press this week, they've, all of the places mentioned have been English cities. So... Um, which I, I don't see how that fulfills the criteria. But to, for, for, for the Scottish government to really get behind that bid, I think, would be fantastic. It's fair to mention, obviously, the BBC isn't the only broadcaster here, and I would say that they're actually miles ahead of the other broadcasters. Channel 4 do commission a number of series here, and again, uh, have returnable series with some of the independent sectors that have really bolstered their business, and it's excellent. And absolutely agree with Annie, if we could get something more uh, more up here, um, and because the regional office has, has, been, has scaled back, if anything, in the last few years, uh, that would be an excellent uh, uh, step forward. Um, but, you know, you, you all, we also have to look at the other broadcasters, STV and others, um, a, 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 as a complete and as a whole as to what they're actually doing here. There are quotas, as has as been mentioned, um, two um, uh, regional quotas for um, that have been uh, implemented by BBC uh, and Channel 4. Um, we would, again, expect lobbying to happen, that that is right across um, all the broadcasters to make sure that it is becomes a more level playing field compared to what's uh, um, uh, the London-centric nature of the, of the business. Okay. Uh, thank, can I thank uh, the panel uh, for giving their evidence today and uh, we'll have a short suspension uh, before we move to our second panel. Thank you.
Yes, uh, good morning. Um, we continue today's evidence session on our inquiry into Scotland's screen sector, and I'd like to welcome our second panel of witnesses, Dr Michael Franklin of the Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship at Goldsmiths College, University of London. Welcome. Uh, Neil Cairns, production accountant. Yep. Uh, welcome. And Arabella Page-Croft, who's the producer of Black Camel Productions and who is very familiar with these types Hello. of inquiries. <laughs> Um, uh, I know that you were all uh, sitting in the gallery for uh, certainly most of the first session of evidence and I saw some of you uh, nodding vigorously at various points, um, particularly uh, la laterally when we're talking about broadcasters. I wondered if you would maybe just like to come in and, and reflect as to why you were nodding vigorously or any other points that you want to make reflecting on that evidence. I was interested when you were talking about the commissioners and the power base in Scotland. I mean, I think like all my colleagues here, you know, the the we are really excited about the opportunity for the new Scottish Channel and the potential commissioning uh, is significant uh, there for everybody, you know, for all of us, and that that is fantastic. Um, you know, I think just you know we do have a drama commissioner in Scotland, and I'm sure you know when the team were here, they were vigorously saying that. But the power and the decision making still rests in London. So at Black Camel, for example, we do have a first look deal with BBC Drama in Scotland. And that's great because it's very good for the narrative of the company. And, I, you know, I do feel supported by the BBC here. But, you know, nevertheless, when it comes to getting the project green lit, that's not a decision that's made in Scotland. That will then go back. I mean, you know, she absolutely is, has power and influence. But the decision rests with the commissioner and the controller in London. So just to clarify that point. Um, I would also just say in terms of, you know, what I would like to see with the B with BBC Scotland, and I come from a sort of drama and film background rather than any other genre, it would be great just to see some risk taking and some, you know, uh, you know, I think, you know, I often sort of look at the Swedes and the Danes and I think that's what we should be doing in Scotland. And years before The Killing and Borgen and The Bridge and The Legacy and all those fantastic series that have kind of created Nordic Noir, you know, those were countries that were still making drama and they were learning how to do it and they became really good at it before they broke onto the, the international stage. And I think, you know, we have a shot with our new channel to really attempt to make some drama and try to get really good at it here with our indigenous companies. And that's what I would like to see, you know, BBC Scotland and, you know, the screen unit really championing, saying it's, you know, we've got to focus on our indigenous companies. And, you know, we were talking a lot about returnability, how you build your business. That is how we're going to build our businesses. And I've just come back from MIT TV. MIT TV is the international market where all the buyers and the distributors go uh, to sell and, you know, you find your co-finance in market and you, you meet everybody. I think there's a, you know, there's a big desire for Scottish products. Scotland is, you know, it's, it's seen globally as a wonderful place to live. Edinburgh's an exciting city. People love Glasgow. You know, there's a, there's a, a the Highlands, everything that we have, you know, as we know as a nation in terms of taking that, uh, you know, almost selling our nation in our dramas to the world. And people want to work with us in Scotland. So, you know, it's it, just a bit more investment, keeping investing. People really want to partner with Scottish producers and they want to do business. You know, I mean, I've been talking, I can talk about <coughs> lots of things, but I'm about to make a Dutch co-production, a feature film with Luxembourg and, uh, uh, and with uh, my Dutch partners. And in the finance plan, the Luxembourg Film Fund are putting in one and a half million. The Dutch Film Fund are putting in 800,000. And I am putting in 250,000. Yet I'm shooting for as much as I'm shooting in Luxembourg. We're having as much of the shoot here. The story is set in Scotland. Apart from the lead role who's going to be Dutch, all the front of camera is going to be, is going to be Scottish for the most part. And yet I'm the, still the poor relation. You know, I haven't been able to bring nearly as much money to the table. I applied for cultural funding, wasn't awarded it. I was awarded production growth funding. So I don't have the equity stake in the film that I should have. So I've digressed completely from drama onto films. But you know, so there's a lot of issues for us to kind of untangle, I think, you know. Uh, Why is that? Why is that happening? 
why did that happen? I don't know whether there was... I think there was a case that we ran out of money when the application went in, and so it was moved to production growth funding rather than cultural funding. It was the end of the year, I believe, but I wasn't... But, you know, that that is important for producers because that part of IP, of owning that share of that film, and a film that I believe that can be a sophisticated thriller and can travel, has been substantially reduced. And because it's a European film, it won't necessarily be able to um, hit the one to six criteria of production growth. So that's another area that I think that if we're making indigenous films or we're partnering with European films, you know, if you're going to have massively high ratios for inward investment, I don't think that can be for indigenous companies where you're, you're trying to build your co-production network across Europe because, you know, very few European films can hit a six to one spend, can they? You know, I mean, Outlander, yes, the American series coming in, of course we must do that, but not for our own producers and our, especially when we're trying to co-produce with lots of different countries. Does so I was nodding else? my head at the, uh, the, uh, the idea of the, the, the new body. I, I don't know what it's going to be called, is the new Creative Scotland body, the new screen yeah. body, <coughs> being um, much more kind of industry focused and led and more responsive and perhaps uh, without the input of um, Scottish Enterprise, I think that would make it a much more flexible, adaptive and uh, reactive uh, body. Uh, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me to and just to uh, answer your question about um, what struck me from the last panel. I thought it was um, a really good uh, point, well, several points made by uh, Nathan, pointing out the necessity for commercial thinking within the screen unit and the ability to capitalise on intellectual property and set up conditions in which that's ha able to happen. And that's a very complex set of arrangements that needs to happen and uh, Mr Boswell made a, a great point about it being joined up thinking so I think we, we were discussing the um, uh, sort of overview of the the unit uh, as it set out and all of these things uh, that it sets out are correct and important and matter and the devil is in the detail and how they are all linked up because they, they all knock on to each other so for example uh, the ability to access funding for different aspects of a business which has technology, which has creative intellectual property, which has um, needs for skills and training. All of those need to be thought through and supported and within, hopefully, a one-stop shop and um, with a capacity to deal with that. And so one of the themes that struck me was integration within those aspects of business and creative thinking uh, within the unit, but also within the industry, both well, sort of within the UK and as, as Arabella points out, uh, European uh, and internationally, it is a very international business um, from individual tranches of finance to individual members of crew and departments. So that thinking about commercial practice and integration with the industry, I think, is, is a really, really key right. thing. Can I just ask you, as someone who's been studied the data, um, we've talked a lot in this committee um, about uh, the criteria for Scottish spend in the context of broadcast and, and Ofcom are looking at that. But there's also the criteria for spend um, in the money that the screen unit will will distribute. And I made the point uh, to the previous panel about in Canada and France, and it came back to me Ireland as well, that the criteria is really, really tough in terms of you've got to employ so much I Irish crew or, or French writers or whatever. Um, is, do you think that there's enough thought gone into how the screen unit's going to do that, and is the data there to be able to uh, deliver that? I mean, that's a that's a really good question. I think there's two parts to unpack there. One would be, um, I mean, I don't know how much the, the the level of thought or thinking or the ability that uh, has been applied at the moment, but and obviously it will be <coughs> applied in future. The the impact of having tough, strict criteria, and you can see the absolute benefits of having those is absolutely a, a thing to pursue. The ability to affect that and make that have an impact depends on how much money you have to spend. So if it is more onerous than, uh, but it's worth it for me as a producer to come here or do a co-production and come here and access, um, or work with uh, Arabella's company and come here and do a co-production as with Luxembourg and with France and what have you, then Produce, international producers will do it and pursue it, and it will be easier for uh, indigenous producers to go out and make those deals and uh, make it attractive. If you have to go through those hoops and there isn't enough money to make it worth your while, then an international co-production won't do it. So that's a question of 
really looking through all of the potential options. You know, a producer will go to, and this holds for um, services, you know, be it post-production and, and deals, what have you. I could make this film in three uh, locations. Uh, I could get some money from a certain uh, European production and, and a UK, it'll be a UK production or something like that. But run through all of the possible incentives to do it. One of which is, you know, how much money I can get as a, uh, as part of equi soft equity from the public funder, and what does that mean in terms of hiring local crew, or uh, and so on. Another aspect is, does there is there linked to that fantastic facilities and a post deal, which is going to put some equity into the film as well and make it effectively a cheaper cheaper shoot. All of those things interact. So that is exactly pointed to your next point, which is the data, right, about how that is managed. So with, you'd think that within the screen unit, people are looking at what are the potential aspects for films of different size, where could they possibly shoot, and what would be the knock-on effects of that. And as I understand it, you know, that data, it doesn't certainly exist, with, uh, to my knowledge, within Scotland, but it's also an issue across the creative industries and across um, the film sphere. Different, you know, different um, uh, agencies are better than others, so Say and Say has a fantastic um, data system. Uh, and they've got lots of money from the French government. Uh, BFI have done some really good stuff recently. Um, but that needs supporting. But that, as you see from the sector deal for the creative industries, which was announced recently, you know, that's pointed out as a specific thing that everyone ac across the creative industries needs to work on. And come back just to my point of integration, um, looking for where there can be efficiency, especially around data. And I know this is part of another panel that hopefully I'll be able to contribute to, to but it needs to be interoperable. So data, you know, those information points that apply to a film that's here in Scotland, shooting in England, what have you, we need to be able to be, have the capacity to understand all, all of it. Okay. Thank you very much. Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, the work of this committee follows on from, I think it's four years ago now, that the Enterprise Committee looked at the film and TV sector um, and also the McCormack report. One of the strong messages from the inquiry a few years ago was the need for a film studio in Scotland with a down studio capacity. And in that time, we've seen um, the success in Belfast. Uh, we've seen Manchester create a studio. I think Liverpool's now building a studio. When we've taken evidence during this session, <coughs> there has been the discussion around the Pentland Studio that's um, been proposed. Um, we've recognised the success of the Ward Park Studios where Outland it is. Do you think that's still the key issue around um, studio capacity and what should the screen unit be focused on? What should the aim of, the, of them be in terms of increasing studio, uh, studio capacity? I think there has to be a, a film studio. I think it has to be something in, in the west of Scotland. I mean, I was working on the Netflix film last year. Uh, we were based in the old Scottish Water Building in Possel. Uh, there were two other productions in there at the same time as one of two smaller productions. There was also a production two miles away in Hindland. So there's a, you know, during the summer months in Scotland, certainly there's a big demand for, for studio space. We had to actually go out to to, uh, to the old Motorola factory to, to build our, our set. So we spent certainly hundreds of thousands of pounds <coughs> building sets out in that out there. Uh, and having people travelling backwards and forwards across. So I think if we had something, let's say the Pentland Studios could be fantastic, obviously for Edinburgh, uh, and in the long term that will be a great uh, facility, and we'll, obviously Edinburgh crews will build up. But uh, at the moment, the vast majority of film crew is based in Glasgow, or around the west of Scotland, and so in practical terms there needs to be something, or I think the, 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 the new body should look at that, there should be some sort of facility in there, even if it's only, you know, turning uh, Balmore Road, the, the Scottish Water Street, into big production offices, or you know, it doesn't even have to perhaps not a fully fledged studio. I don't know, but uh, th there's certainly that. I think that would attract uh, further business uh, for us. Mm -hmm. and Arabella, do you have any views I, on that? I've on made that a lot of films in sheds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I like. Uh, everybody and you know particularly the crew who are uh, working in these you know uh, these buildings all the time I think there is a, a it would be fantastic to have a studio in the west of Scotland I agree with Neil completely um, you know definitely I'd just like to, to point out I, I agree, completely agree that the most capacity the more capacity the better I think Nason made a really good point uh, earlier in in the um, first panel is that it does have a knock-on impact in access to crew and to talent and what you I think was mentioned uh, earlier about the sort of there's quite a polarization in the types of films that can be made so that there are 
successful low budget films and successful you know, very, very high budget films. And the great success that the UK has had with high end TV means that um, the key talent which are used to green light or um, supposed to be bankable stars probably are attracted to um, being committed to these longer seasons, which makes it more difficult for independent film productions to access that talent and to be um, to go into production. So um, taking that on board as well as sort of having a holistic view of how we support, yes, absolutely need screen, uh, studio capacity, how that is linked to financing is really, really important. Um, if you look at the patient capital review, which has just been concluded in new guidance issued around EIS um, funding, equity investment uh, scheme, that has just been reviewed, that the risk to capital allocations have been changed. Um, that will have an impact on film financing and the amount that, of EIS funding or the type of risk that's pursued by EIS funding, which forms part of a tranche of a feature film. And when um, people go to a production studio, often production studios have a film fund that's linked to that. So Pinewood, for example, has a TV fund and a film feature film fund, and they advise and manage or have advised and managed other film funds. So how those are linked is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Do you think there was, um, you might have seen some of the newspaper reports around the finance that was given to out to um, so the Outlaw King, the Netflix film, um, and the coverage in the media was fairly negative about the investment that had been given. I think it was £1 million pounds was given to the company for the production. Not to comment on the Outlaw King, but do you think um, that type of um, investment is appropriate? Is that what is needed to bring in? And do, is there any... Um, uh, conditions that should be attached to money that is given that's, that's public investment, do you think, or is that a misunderstanding of how the well, sector There works? were some conditions attached. I think it was a, a, a minimum spend requirement, but we were always going to hit that anyway. I think, mm -hmm. you know, Group Scotland typically requires something like five to one. If you invest £500,000, you need to prove that you've spent at least two and a half million, say, in Scotland. Or and you, That's broadly defined. It's not Scottish crew or facilities. It's hotels and per diems and, and various other things. So... I mean, that, that million pounds that came into Outlaw King wouldn't have made any difference in reality to Netflix. Netflix were going to make that film anyway, but it might make them come back. You know, they, 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 look, they, they look at the bottom line, they say this, the net of this film is such and such an amount, and they take into account all of the tax credits that they can get, any uh, public sector investment that they can get, and uh, and that's, that's a you know, that, that's absolutely vitally important to them. It's same, I worked on uh, Trainspotting 2 the year before, and it was similar with Sony. Um, they look at the bottom line. That's, they, they have their budgets. They think of everything as net. What, what's the net cost of this film? Then they can, they can work out what's going to go into profit. And so, again, you know, Creative Scotland invested money into that. It may, you know, they may not have uh, required to do it. They, it wouldn't have changed the decision that Sony made. It increased the budget slightly. But it might make Sony come back. They think, okay, this is an accessible fund. It doesn't have many, uh, it doesn't have any drawbacks for us. It's not onerous. Uh, so we would come back to Scotland and uh, knowing that that is potentially available to us, it's on top of the UK tax credit, which of course is extremely valuable to the, the American studios. I think also, you know, it does empower the producer. You know, that that bit of money just says, you know, she's a producer, we take seriously in our country. You know, that's important, you know, a recognition to the world as well. And for Netflix to see that, I yeah. think, coming in to, to see the support for Zygma and for Gillian and her team on that film. So, yeah, I would advocate it. I mean, I know it obviously is a huge amount of money. It would feel like a huge amount of money. But in terms of the revenue, I hope, generated by the film and, you know, should they go again? Uh, it, it, I think it was money well spent, I hope, for all of you and for all of us. Yeah. Thank you. I, I would agree, and I'd just add that I think um, Ian Smith, in the first of your panels, made the point that it's just exactly as you're saying, it's just it's an incentive, an added, an, added, an added bonus that makes it a good place for inward investment for filmmaking. Um, but also, I think, it, uh, as part of the British Film Commission, you know, and I think there were quite a lot of questions were, were, were made about this, uh, the open or forward facing or open facing, is there a one stop shop where people can come and find all this information, right? And this has been a priority obviously for, to get this right. But I think linked to this, these type of incentives is a need not only just to be responsive, to have a you know, nice front facing website which really clear that all of these things are on offer and how you can come and access all our facilities and money, but also the, for there to be outreach. And so the British Film Commission, uh, 
the, of which Ian Smith was the, the, is the chair, uh, they, they are constantly going on outward bound missions to, to Los Angeles and other places, ed educating people about the tax credit and educating uh, producers that might want to come to the UK about um, the facilities within, namely, you know, the main ones that we have in, in, in London, uh, the southeast, and of course, new taking people on uh, fact finding missions that you yourselves have been on to. Um, Yorkshire or to Manchester and what have you. And I think as part of the outreach and outbound, you know, part of the holistic element of the screen unit, that has to be part of it. So that when uh, people in different countries are being advised or educated about what's on offer here, they know that there is when the Petland Studios or whatever whatever it is that we've got. So it is, it's about being proactive as well as re responsive. Just a quick supplementary to that. I mean, do you think that perhaps the negative publicity that um, that that particular investment generated was perhaps triggered because it was basically Creative Scotland giving the money, and perhaps that's an argument for a standalone agency because basically you've, you've got you know maybe a, a small theatre company that's lost its you know it's fifteen thousand pounds a year because of a decision, then looking at Netflix getting this money. And perhaps the two don't sit particularly well together. That seems possible. Yeah, yeah, I can understand how you can conflate uh, both yeah. of those when it seems as if it's coming from the same body. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, Richard Lockhead. <coughs> can I just ask Neil Cairns, uh, looking at your your biog and our notes, you've worked internationally in various productions, and <coughs> we've had some key messages about the support or lack of support at times in Scotland. Can you reflect on your international experiences and where Scotland sits in terms of your perception of support um, given in each country? Um, I, I think Scotland sits rather well. I, I think, I mean, if, say for example, I've worked in Vancouver and in New Mexico and they, they, have, they have greater incentives uh, based on labour employing local labour uh, and using uh, local production companies and so that it's a local production company who can get the access to tax credit. In Vancouver it's up to 35% of, of labour uh, is accessible on top of other state um, subsidies which has led to Vancouver becoming a hugely successful uh, production centre and, and similarly in New Mexico there's a very, very good uh, incentive for uh, employing New Mexican labour. Um, in terms of Scotland, the, I think I, I've worked in a variety of productions in which sometimes people have come to Scotland because it's specifically, for example, Outlaw King came because Gillian Berry's the producer and David McKenzie's the director, and it's Robert Bruce that's set in Scotland or Train Spotting set in Edinburgh. So there's some very specific things that uh, have come here because of that. There are other. I worked on The Wife, which is a Glenn Close film set in America and in Stockholm. Fantastic film, which hasn't been released yet, but that. It's nothing to do with Scotland, but the producer came to Scotland because he'd previously made Churchill here. He'd got support from Creative Scotland and came here to make his £5 million film, uh, dressing uh, everything, you know, very successfully creating New York and New Hampshire and, uh, uh, and Stockholm within Scotland. So I think we have, we've got good crews, we've got, I think the, the support is good, the, the Creative Scotland support has been uh, very successful when people get it obviously when because it's a competitive uh, structure people uh, have to apply for it if there could be some way in which it could be made more uh, definite you know if we if we found a way of getting a some sort of labor incentive where you employ if you employed Scottish crew you got maybe 25 percent back on that on top of the UK tax credit I mean we already in terms of the production growth fund we already asked people to hit a certain minimum Scottish spend or a multiplier of a Scottish spend, so perhaps we can uh, we can do something like that. We're, we're producers would come in advance and know, okay, if we hit, if we employ such and such a Scottish amount of crew, then we'll definitely achieve funding. We're not just applying to create Scotland and hoping that we get money. We'll say, we'll definitely, we know we can do the UK tax credit, and then on top of that, we also can get another 20% because we're employing lots of Scottish crew. So I think Scotland is a really good, flexible country to, to make films in, and I think a lot of people recognise that, but it could be even better. 
the new BBC channel. Um, Annabelle made this point, and had made it in the previous session, but we didn't have time to follow up. How do we use the opportunity of the new channel as, as a springboard to grow capacity and grow the industry f um, and actually grow non-BBC production in Scotland? Because we spend a huge amount of time as a committee, quite rightly, um, scrutinising the BBC and their quotas for Scotland, but there's a whole other world of production out there as well. It strikes me that the new channel is an opportunity to grow an industry that will have considerable benefits outside of the BBC, but how, in particular the screen unit, what relationship should the, the screen unit have with the BBC and the new channel that actually allows for much wider industry growth? Um, first of all, I am concerned about the budget for the new channel. I think as a drama producer, it's a very low budget given the, the responsibilities it's been given to produce news uh, and the like. So I am really concerned about, you know, if we are going to create some indigenous drama from Scotland, that is an area for definitely more work and more lobbying. In terms of my, I have a distribution relationship with all three media, and you know they, that is a direct route to market. And if we can get, you know, the BBC, BBC obviously in terms of its reputation, and BBC Scotland in terms of a re reputation, are you know this is an amazing brand for us to be able to take to the world. If I, as a producer, can go to my distributor and say, I have just got a six-part drama series from BBC Scotland, I can get the rest of the money from the world. You know, if that's even th probably 30 to 30% 30 of the budget, 40%, I can go and get the rest of the world in terms of deficit finance, international co-production and partners. Um, so, you know, I believe, obviously, if it's a commercial genre. Um, so I think, you know, that's, you know, just my, my first point would be, you know, let's ensure that we keep lobbying for more money because if there's more money and we can have more commissions and we can hit returnable series, that is where our growth is. And all three media have taken a risk on me recently, but they know that if I deliver them one drama series that strikes and returns, that is, my, that is where the gold is. You know, so, that, so that's where, and I think you were talking earlier in terms of risk versus public funding. We've got to take risk. You know, I remember when I got my first slate funding from Creative Scotland and I'd made one film, and I was, you know, a very, very high risk for them to put a bit of money into me, but they took a chance. We've got to be taking a chance on our producers at this point. They are hungry to deliver. They are hungry to go to market. They want to be able to have a shot at this you know there is huge excitement in our industry about you know about this channel and what it can deliver but we need to get more money into that channel and we need to get more money out of london so that we can deliver uh, and i think you know that can have a huge a huge um impact nationally and globally you know globally i think we're going to deliver some fantastic um programs let's do it have you in terms of the new channel have you had much engagement from bbc scotland so far these discussions around this afternoon on <laughs> feedback <laughs> excellent yeah the new scripted uh, uh, person has just been appointed gavin smith so i've got a meeting with him Fantastic. so i'll find out what their budgets really are um rachel hamilton thank you convener um we know that drama has been one of the large uh, sort of global growth markets but scotland really hasn't um uh, taken that in terms of the significant growth that we've seen here we, we just um, are kind of lagging behind I suppose um, I did notice that um, the screen sector had recommended that we need more support in um, writing developing and producing skills and then I was looking also at the the high-end TV levy fund which actually um, has a, a contribution of a skills levy of two million I wondered if any of the uh, panellists knew how that uh, skills levy was actually um, spent in Scotland, if that is what the skills uh, we are requiring um, to increase drama production. I think presumably that's skill sets. Uh, yeah. We've got five skill set trainees on. I'm working on a, a film called Born to Run just now in Fraserburgh. And uh, we've got five skill set <coughs> trainees on that just now. So they're obviously at the very beginning of their careers, I think one in sound, one in uh, production, one in assistant director. So those skill set, we pay the wages and then skill set re refund half of that to us. So that, that for that particular, I mean, five trainees is obviously very useful for a, a relatively low budget uh, film that we're having half of their wages subsidised. So that, that's the way it has worked in my experience. We had uh, 
kind of low budget films tend to access lower budget films tend to access skill set trainees. Um, I'm not sure. If, I'm not aware of any other uh, element of their funding. And Neil, do you think that um, the ambition that the um, screen sector has uh, to increase drama production by 100% is uh, is going to be achievable? with those skills within the time frame that they have set out and the growth um, in terms of the uh, financial growth that they've set out? I, I don't really have an overview of that. I mean, I think, yes, I think it is. I mean, I think people can be trained up relatively quickly. Obviously, the NFTS is now set up in Glasgow as well, which will help um, to refine and hone uh, higher end skills, uh, which we definitely need in Scotland as well. But yes, I mean, as I say, Last summer, I was working with there were five, I think, there were Outlander in Cumbernauld, three productions in uh, Balmore Road, and one in Hindland. So there's a big, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of, of crew, Scottish crew members being employed. Uh, so there, there is a pretty big production base. Some people then go back and do other things in the winter when there's less production, but um, I think there is quite a a big base of people. Okay, so to develop that, if we have the skills and we are investing in the skills, why haven't why hasn't high end uh, drama productions increased at the rate of the the rest of the world? We don't have a studio. I mean, I think when that's I it. just offered a job in in Cardiff uh, because that's got a studio and uh, the, the last, I'm a freelancer. The last three big jobs I've been offered one was in Cardiff, one was in Budapest, and one in Manchester, uh, which I haven't taken any of them, but. Uh, they're uh, all because of the studios there. So. But the, those are studio productions, producers based where? In uh, London the, or? Uh, the London one is Doctor Who producers who are making a big production in Cardiff, but they're, they're also based in Cardiff. The Manchester one's a London producer. The Budapest one is an American <coughs> producer. I think one of the issues which we have faced, and I think you, know, you may not see a return for a a couple of years but but you know we have now Clemendel has just got the cry which is a drama commission that's an australian scottish co-production that's a four-part drama stv productions after a lot of investment get alan clements tell you how much investment he's put into his drama development you know i've got this much compared with what stv have had over the last however many years but they have now won two commissions you know they are definitely back in business so that's really good that's you know indigenous companies now producing drama we want to see much more of that um, I'm like this at the moment, waiting for a commission like this. So, you know, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, hopefully very soon. Um, you know, but these are, these are, you know, these are game changing amounts of, of, you know, of drama that, that, I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's early days, but those are indigenous companies with dramas that are going to, to shoot here. And that's great. And if, you know, we'll see if they return, I don't know whether, uh, any of them can return. I don't know the the the, the scripts, but you know, I, th I would say, you know, producing is quite a, a precarious business because it's quite difficult to teach the skill set of a producer because you have to have a a nose for an eye, you know, an eye for a product. You have to kind of think, can I do something with that? You have to take a certain amount of risk. You have to say, is that worth an IP worth chasing? Shall I option that theatre show? You know. A lot of it is so about the personality of the producer, um, and I, it's quite—I don't know—in terms of skills, it's—it's it's, you can't quite put your finger on. You know, there are different types of producer producers who come through script editing training through the BBC. So we should definitely be, you know, putting lots of money into that. Those are really good script editors, but there are, you know, different producers. I mean, you know, Nason has come from, you know, an economics background. I've come from, you know, from the floor, from being a runner uh, for many years and making lots of tea and coffee for people. Um, you know, so we all come from lots of different places. Um, I'm not sure I'm kind of exactly answering your question, but I'm saying, you know, investment in writing, you know, our best writer. If we can develop our writers over the next, you know, five, ten years, you know, they're going to be the showrunners of the future. Let's keep ploughing that skill set investment um, into them. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I think the point regarding a film studio has came out uh, very strongly, not just today, but certainly in other sessions that we've had. And Mr Keir Drew spoke about one in the west of Scotland. I think the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency would be an ideal location <laughs> to have uh, another film studio, just to get that on the record. Um, but but there, was, there was one point that's actually come out, certainly from today, which I think has been really important as well, and that's the, uh, just the, the whole issue of internationalisation. 
development process. I mean, uh, Ms Croft, you spoke about the a moment ago regarding this um, Scottish Australian um, production, and earlier on about the Scottish Dutch and Luxembourg. And uh, Mr. Cairn just spoke about the the program um, between Scotland and the US with uh, the Sweden and US link. Um, I mean, how, how common, how prevalent actually is this within the sector uh, in terms of the, the multinational uh, production operations like that? I have not worked in so many Scottish uh, uh, co productions, mainly been London. Uh, Based co-productions, obviously the things like Filth, uh, which had that, that um, Belgium and Swiss, uh, sorry, Swedish uh, co-producing elements. Um, but most of the, certainly most of the lower budget. Yeah, a lot of Sigma have made, you know, a lot of international uh, co-productions. Um, you know, I think uh, as the budgets go higher, mm. you, you, we do tend to co-produce more. Uh, I've got another Australian project I'm uh, sort of considering at the moment whether I, I co I'd like to co-produce. A lot of it, again, it's coming down to our companies, though. You know, our companies are still very small. You know, if we, if I had somebody who was, you know, an in-house line producer, I'd be saying, right, let's chase all the co, -pro you know, let's have lots of co-production, mm. let's bring that, bring them in, let's get those productions churned over. But I think, you know, as we heard earlier, you know, we've got to be making more productions a year and not waiting and seeing, you know, our producers only making a film every three years. You know, we need to be, if these companies are to be built, I mean, one of the, the things I do feel, and it sort of leads on from international, you know, if international leads to more business and more films being made, and then we can actually get more money into the businesses, it's about, you know, enabling producers to staff up, which is one of the things I'm quite keen to see at the moment. Yeah, I'll just add that. It's a really uh, absolutely great point. And it links to the previous question about skills as well, is that an impact, a demonstrable impact can be made by hiring, you know, one other person, one other very good person as a development executive, as a, you know, um, as a line producer that within a small, these are all very small companies, certainly in Scotland. But having that uh, does have a demonstrable impact. I mean, there has been, uh, I've noticed uh, in categorical examples of, there was a Creative England scheme that essentially was just, they'd cover the costs of a person working for a small um, production company for a year. They then, you know, not only learn how the, you know, the on-the-job skills of having to be a producer, how to, how to do that, but also at the same time as working on a larger budget film were able to develop their own ideas and go on to then you know, develop their own career and perhaps long-term have their own uh, company. So that, that support is something that certainly is achievable with a relatively small amount of money compared to, you know, contributing to a larger budget of, you know, uh, huge productions. Um, in, in relation to the uh, idea of internationalization of, of co-productions, I think that's it's a really good point to, to make at this particular juncture when we are possibly faced with the lack of access to Creative Europe or media funding as was in the next few years. So there's a potential that that will be lost. And that has, and there's a report out recently that identified exactly what support was made available to the UK during the, the life of the media fund, which was substantial. And so if that is not going to be accessible, we need to find a way of supporting people to access international co-productions or replace that money. Um, so that is a strategic uh, point that we need, we need, to, we need to make. And linked to that is uh, understanding what benefits that has to your company. So for example, if you have a returning series, which are the key assets that TV and film companies have made, uh, if you, that is done by a broadcaster in the UK, um, the international returning rights are set with the company, right? So they're able to capitalise on that IP uh, and get investment on the basis of that. So that's how you see federalised larger distributors go in and buy a proportion of uh, a producer in order to do that. And that's how they get scale, right? To get to these multi-million pound companies. That rights allocation is not the same if you're dealing with an SVOD company, a Netflix, right? You don't get, it, it's a buyout. It's a, a cost plus model. So the, the, that IP is handed over and no incremental returns are available. You might get another series with that person. So, you know, there's the Crown series one and two, and that is fantastic and will set up that company in terms of direct revenue, but it's not the same thing as ownership. So mapping out these different scopes for the business is important, uh, the, the businesses within Scotland is important. What are the potential routes? Because it's, it's great to have these um, you know, top level figures of what we want to get to a certain number of companies, certain number of turnover, but there are multiple different business models within the film and television sector, uh, which have different approaches to risk and how they construct their projects. I think it would be really nice, it would be great to see um, 
uh, one of the things coming out of the screen about you know if you've got producers who are keen to hire. Uh, for example, I really, really want to take on... I've been working with freelance script editors and I really want to take on a head of development. And I've identified somebody who's been working at Sky, working on Strike Back. She's working with me across a number of projects. She's keen to go full-time, but I can't afford her. But she's my, she's one of my game-changer me members of staff. So, let you know... And I'm sort of thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to be able to access any money at Scottish Enterprise because I haven't got the huge turnover. You know, so how do I facilitate that because the only way I can really facilitate some high-end uh, personnel employments is if I have a big series and I get a big production fee and that goes into my pocket but the there is a moment there's a window here where I haven't got a big series yet I haven't got a head of development yet and this is where we're very vulnerable you know where your aspirations and your ambitions are, are big but there's a point where you know w w another member of staff as you, you know we discussed is it can be a game changer see with the new screen sector uh, as proposed, uh, but do you think that would actually help uh, you in your position now, uh, but also other uh, businesses? Do you think that will actually help uh, deliver that? Uh, definitely. And I think, you know, you can incentivise producers and you can say, look, we can give you a percentage towards a member of staff, you know, go and see if you can get, you know, 30% out of the market, if you've got a distributor relationship, or let them argue the case, you know, everybody, all the companies have got different cases. You know, they may come and say, I don't know, whether it's fact or entertainment or, you know, we're looking at different genres today, but, they, you know, we've heard from Caledonia this morning that they are really struggling in terms of their development people. I'm struggling in terms of my producing partners, you know, of producing for other people so that we can keep going. You know, we need to take stop and go, right, what have we got here? Who are our good producers? How do we help stabilise and create sustainability while they are in their, you know, ambitious phases of growth? Uh, and Mr Franklin, you mentioned a few moments ago regarding the European uh, funding. Uh, are you aware of any discussions around that uh, in terms of when the UK does leave the, the EU, in terms of any, uh, any continuation of that type of funding? Uh, uh, there hasn't been, as I'm as far as I'm aware, any complete firm confirmation about what we'll be able to access when we leave. At the moment, we're, until we leave, we've, we've got access to it. Um, there is also currently, um, you'll have seen the... Um, creative industry sector deal, the large uh, allocation of 150 million to creative services more broadly across the UK. Even that, I, as I understand it, has still not been decided whether this is designed to replace some missing money that we previously would have got from those programmes or it's additional. So there, it, it, it's, it's unclear. What, what is really clear is that the, those aspects of um, media funding have been impactful uh, over the last 10 years and we need to find a way to replace them. It also it's important that they are, when it's replaced, it is done so on a basis that is fair and equitable and better representative diversity because I think I think it was recently at a conference was shown that the actual amount of money going to, for example, female directors was sort of 20% of the money compared to, 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 to others. So I think as all of this, there is an opportunity to build something new and very uh, ground up, well organised and that, you know, th that optimism from the new station, from the new unit, from uh, the uh, investigation across the whole UK on you know, data and organising it properly uh, it is a really good uh, place, place to build upon. Um, but th it's, it's, it's sort of an unsaid bit at the moment. We, I mean, we've ne we haven't been part of Euromage for a while, um, which is a co-production agreement. Um, but as made from the previous point, we need to think about ways to incentivise collaboration and uh, ways to make it as easy as possible for these international larger scale co-productions to come to pass. Because uh, as people have mentioned, it's incredibly competitive. Yes, we have this fantastic boom in high-end television, um, but now, you know, and, and typically finan uh, financially, film independent film communities have been marginal and continue to be marginal as corporate finance businesses. Um, lots of people want to move into high-end television, but it's incredibly, incredibly competitive. Not everyone is going to succeed to do that. So, uh, as mentioned in the first panel, the, the ability to have the, the core factual returning commissions, uh, indigenous productions, built onto routes of access to scale up, to access these large international, um, possibly with private sector, or even um, you see a lot of uh, co-productions with, so they'll have maybe Sky from the UK, 
an American uh, studio and then a national broadcaster. So um, Berlin Babylon is a, a recent one. I think it's one of the largest uh, foreign language ones uh, with the Berlin, uh, a German uh, national broadcaster. But to, to look into all of those potential models and how we can best support them is, is really, really important. Thank you. Annabelle, did you want to say something about the Brexit impact? Uh, uh, well, I've, as I said, I've just come back from TV and, you know, from the market and every meeting I went into, everybody went, what's going to happen? At the moment, you know, everyone's happy to continue, but, you know, there's a big nervousness in the market about how we are going to, how European countries are going to partner with us subs uh, subsequently. So, uh, you know, that's, we do need you know, kind of clarity over that. And also, you know, just I was trying to set up a, a you know, I had a route to Netflix, very difficult for everybody to get to Netflix, but, you know, there was a potential route to Netflix. And Netflix have a European quota. And I was saying to my, my partner on this particular series is a French co-producer. And she said, look, what are we going to do? And we said, well, you know, if we end up with it going to Netflix, and who knows whether it will or not, you know, will I have to set up my company to hit the Euro, to set up a company for that show as a European company, not as a Scottish company? I don't know, but that was just something that with a with a European quota under Netflix deal um, may need to be something that we cross a bridge at a certain time. I don't know, you know, where we're going to be, but it, yes, there are concerns from, <coughs> you know, international about how to work with us okay. at this moment. Interesting. We are slightly over time, but I'm aware that we spent a lot of time in the first panel talking about the Scottish Enterprises role within uh, the screen unit and the configuration of the new screen unit as a collaboration of uh, different agencies within Scottish Enterprise. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's been quite a lot of negativity towards, um, within Scot Creative Scotland rather, there's been quite a lot of negativity towards um, the role of Scottish Enterprise, but at the same time, Nathan this morning did mention that at least they brought business expertise. So I wondered if you were able to reflect on that, how you saw the new unit, how you saw Scottish Enterprise's role within the new unit. Is it a positive thing or would you rather you, they weren't there? Uh, I think I speak for pretty much all the independent producers when we would we would strongly advocate for an independent unit and with the resources from Scottish Enterprise put into that unit. I think Nathan made a good point when he was talking about mergers and acquisitions and you know when we do have companies of scale maybe at that point when it becomes more corporate Scottish Enterprise's expertise will be valued but at this point where we are growing our companies from the ground up we need you know a screen unit that really gets under the skin of the whole whole industry and begins to know, you know, I, th I think, you know, the great thing about Scotland is that we are not a big country and it's not difficult for those people who are in running the new screen unit to have a really clear sense of who are entry level, who are mid level, who are the potential big players, you know, and if we put it, those, that strategic system in place, you can see the gr you can see the growth, and then maybe you know that's a good idea at the right point. If there is a you know a, a merger and acquisition, and companies are growing, then they move into a more corporate position. But one screen unit for the companies that we have at the moment, um, maybe you know uh, excluding STV and IWC, uh, would be fantastic. Yeah. I, I think the argument is that mm. you know they will be there for yep. the larger companies. Definitely. It surprised me to, to hear you say you've made sunshine on Leith. I would think of you as a, and most people would think of you as a big player, but you don't you don't qualify no. for that kind of support. No, but I, you know I haven't got a you know, look. It takes one drama series to, to to radically transform a producer's turnover. I mean, radically to take you up into the ten million turnover a year. So you know it's all to play for. Uh, that's that's the thing. I'm not no, but I'm not there no. yet. <laughs> um, just going, just one final point as well. We really need to talk about leadership, and you know, I think obviously there's a lot of uncertainty in the industry at the moment about the leadership of the uh, leadership of the screen unit. And uh, sorry, that <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> 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 
So we, we are really pleased. Let's get a fantastic leader for the screen unit. Um, you know, somebody who loves the industry. I mean, what I'd like to see is somebody who just loves the industry from um, the ground up, from education, audiences, loves filmmakers. You know, that's what we need because that person who's going to be our leader is going to be the front facing person to the world. And we need them, you know, championing Scotland everywhere and going out and, you know, representing our producers, playing Cupid to the world between Scotland and, you know, I hope Netflix and Amazon and, you know, BBC, whoever it is, you know, that we, we just really need an engaging, intelligent, really charismatic, brilliant leader. So I hope you can find that person. <laughs> Sadly, it's not our job. <laughs> I know. Uh, does anyone else want to come in on that final point about Scottish Enterprise and the screen unit and... Just, just make one sort of related point in that, uh, like exactly as Arabella says, in terms of the um, high-level corporate uh, or commercial functionality, the, and this being a, a timely moment, um, Blaze and Griffin have been expert in identifying routes to get different types of finance to develop the different aspects of their business model. Um, there are, as you see, increasing innovation in things like VR and uh, AR and the development, the cross um, platform application of technology. So, for example, using a games engine and motion capture technology to use in a game, but also in um, live stage shows and also in feature films, and etc. Those businesses, which hopefully will, will more of which will, will develop within Scotland around studios and around larger company investment, they need to be supported in the most easy or most accessible way possible. Uh, Blazing Drifting have done extremely well about finding the support from Scottish Enterprise and, and different aspects. What there is a, at the moment is a, um, a understanding or a look into the way in which our research and development R&D tax credits are understood and developed within the UK. So there's a uh, Nesta paper by Hassan Bakshi uh, looking at the redefinition of R&D so it can be applied in creative and cultural fields. That is would be hugely important and impactful. So if there's a way for the government to be supportive of that and to look at these these strategic interventions where rethinking of these models can come to pass, and that would be like linked to you know how Scottish Enterprise could perhaps then support people in applying for those sort of grants. Because at the moment, you know, you have um, experts in the field acknowledging that VR, you know, has not taken off as, as projected in terms of uh, cash because there's not enough uh, investment in the content. And where a lot of producers talk about is that really in the ability to develop content, to have a development producer on staff, that is really, really important to develop the whole business. Without the creative content, no one wants to go and put on a pair of VR goggles, right? So you need that content, but you need to be able to finance that. And if the barriers to finance are purely by definition of how R&D is understood, you know, you have a problem there. So th those are the kind of sort of policy interventions that you guys can hopefully help with it and also ensure that the new screen unit is on top of. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll have to wind up there. Can I thank our second panel of witnesses and uh, I'll suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave the table. We have another item of business we need to move on to quite quickly, uh, but thank you very much. Our second item of business today is consideration of Legislative Consent Memorandum LCM S515 lodged by Fiona Hislop, MSP, the Cabinet Secretary for Culture, Tourism and External Affairs. Uh, the committee has been designated as the lead committee in relation to this LCM uh, for the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Amendment Bill. 
The purpose of the bill is to remove a sunset clause from the parent legislation, which is the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Act 2009. And the effect of the parent legislation is to enable national institutions to transfer ownership of objects within their collections where these are found to have been stolen during the Holocaust. So members are asked to consider whether to recommend that Parliament agree to a legislative consent motion as outlined in the memorandum in relation to the Holocaust Return of Cultural Objects Amendment Bill and to delegate to the convener and the clerk the production of a short factual report uh, detailing the committee's consideration and arranging for its publication. Are members content with this? Yes. I can now suspend the meeting and move on to private session.